Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We come to the topic of the music of poetry. This is the heart of poetry that we will see now. Poetry is basically musical, it is rhythmical, it achieves its rhythm and music by repetition, rhyme, rhythm and meter. It also uses the figures of sound extensively. These are rhyme, repetition, alliteration and assonance. How is poetry closely connected with music? Actually, poetry is musical right from the beginning of poetry composition. Inspired by the muses, poems are written with a sense of rhythm. Actually, they, bega they began as songs. Originally, poems were set to music on lyre. Hence, we have the term lyric and also lyrical. These days, we do not see much rhythm or music in poetry because poetry is far removed from the original music. Now, we print poems, we do not recite them or sing them as often as the ancient poets did. Of course, now we have a revival, we have the facility of recording video and audio versions and uploading them in electronic media. We have live reading of poems by poets which are available on YouTube. The original voice of W. B. Yeats, T. S. Eliot, Robert Frost and others you can hear just search for them. We have live singing of poems by poets who composed their own poems. These are recorded and these are available on YouTube. Just watch Maya Angelou singing and dancing. Similarly, Bob Dylan composing that is music, he sings along with his musical instrument guitar and mouth organ. It is a pleasure to watch Maya Angelou and Bob Dylan on YouTube. There is no poetry without rhythm because it derives its music from the poetic line. What is that poetic, poetic line? Let us look at this example. I wandered like a lonely cloud. This was mistakenly copied by Wordsworth's wife Mary Hutchinson. Based on this, we have made up a different line. I wandered as a lonely cloud. Now, let us look at this original line. I wandered lonely as a cloud. This is the actual line written by Wordsworth. All these three have similar sentiments, images, syllables and beats. I wandered like a lonely cloud, I wandered lonely as a cloud. But you can see there is a difference in the rhythm and meaning. Let us read the first two lines of this poem together. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills. We begin with rhyme. Rhyme is actually an echo. It is a reverberating sound throughout the poem. It creates an interlocking pattern of emphasis from the beginning to the end. Wainwright says about rhyme as follows. Rhyme is a play with words and its first effect is on pleasure. It comes from delighted surprise at words, remote from each other in meaning, but which happen to sound alike or made to coincide. This coincidence coming together creates a sound effect. William Blake's poem, The Tiger, is a good example. Here we have stanza 5 for you. When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Spears, tears, see, the, these are rhyming words. We also have repetitions of sounds in did he, did he, 
slightly variation in the case of made and make. You can see further sounds when heaven down. It is possible to see how the poet is able to connect all these words and sound together to create the effect of the tiger. There are many different functions of rhyme. Here we have listed eight of them. Rhyme creates aesthetic effects to give pleasure. It contributes to the meaning of the poem. Sometimes rhymes help us discover the meaning of the poem. When we are in trouble sometimes which meaning to think of, rhymes can confirm our own conjectural meaning. Many times rhymes draw attention to themselves. In some cases rhymes will not allow us to have a different meaning, the meaning is closed within the poem. Rhymes keep the poem together in a network of patterns, sound patterns and most importantly poems we remember because rhymes strengthen the memory and vision of the reader. How do rhymes work in poetry? Here we have an explanation for the operation of rhymes in poetry. Rhymes occur due to similarity in sounds. These sounds are created by a combination of syllables. The common syllable structure that we have is this CVC CVC that means consonant vowel consonant one word another word consonant vowel consonant. So, here we have for every one we every one of these structures we have these examples bat and bit the same con the same consonant vowel consonant structure we have, but this example of bat and bit is called alliteration. The next one cool and food is called assonance because in between we have this vowel we focus on vowel now and in the third one we have consonants pack sack ka sound is emphasized here. Vowel sound is different in pack and this is different in sock, but common sound is ka in pack and sock then it becomes consonants. Next we have rhymes, we have different names for them. If they have certain patterns we, we call them in different names. Sock and rock when two words come together like this the vowel and the last sound that is consonant if they rhyme together it is called strict rhyme. Next knack and nat this is called reverse rhyme because the first sound knack knack this is the same but the last sounds are final sounds are different that is why it is called reverse rhyme. We have another group called para rhyme, half rhyme, slant rhyme or partial rhyme that we have in crick and crack. The vowels in these two words are different. If the vowels are similar and the consonants are also similar then we have rhyme bridge that is full rhyme excellent rhyme we have word word spelling is different but the same sound we have in both words. In addition to this we define or describe different kinds of rhyme. We can identify masculine rhyme in a poem when we have in the single syllable just one syllable the rhyme is achieved through single syllabled words that is late and fate only one syllable you have a consonant and a vowel together make this single syllable. Next we have feminine rhyme we have two syllables that is double syllables follow and follow rhymes with hollow. When we have two sounds together like still and hill we have full rhyme. Earlier we saw this half part slant rhyme we have this example from Dickinson grain and sun last in sound is similar that is why it is partial. 
whatever comes at the end of poetic lines we call them end rhymes. We also have rhymes within the line horizontally and sometimes we can also have vertically. Here we have examples of internal rhyme horizontally in Coleridge's poem the rhyme of the ancient mariner. In mist or cloud or on mast or shroud glimmer the white moonshine whilst all the night through fog smoke white. Mast rhymes with mist, cloud rhymes with shroud in the first line here. Similarly, night rhymes with white in this uh, line. So, when we have in the same line rhymes like this, we call them internal rhymes. We have different kinds of end rhyming patterns. We have different names for them, couplet, triplet, quartet. We have this example of couplet from Shakespeare's sonnet 18. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. We have an example from Dryden's MacFlecno for triplet. For ancient Decker prophesied long since that in this pile should felon a mighty prince, born for a scourge of wit and flail of sense. The example we have for quatrain A A B B or A B A B or A B B A quatrain can have four lines. There are different rhyming patterns. We have an example for A B A B in Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country church chart. Now fades a glimmering landscape on the site and all the year a solemn stillness holds. Say where the beetle wheels his droning flight and drowsy inklings lull the distant folds. Sight, flight, holds, folds, A, B, A, B. That is a end rhyme pattern we have in quatrain. As we said, we have different kinds like A, A, B, B or A, B, B, A. Now, let us come to this heart of the matter of poetry that is rhythm. Volaski says rhythm is the heart of the matter of poetry, without rhythm there is no poetry. How do we know it there is a rhythm in poetry? She suggests the best way for us to understand the rhythm of poetry is to read poems widely, read more and more of poems gradually we will come to feel the rhythm of poetry. Actually, some poets may begin writing their poem with a rhythmic phrase in their mind. That is from the composition point of view. We as readers also remember poems by the rhythm which holds on to us. And sometimes we recognize poets by the individual rhythms they create. These are all common in our experience. We also know that revolutions are brought about in poetry scenario by poets by bringing in new rhythms. That is why we say poets bring about revolutions in poetry by introducing new rhythms through their radically innovative diction and meter. Elizabethan poetry is different from metaphysical poetry or neoclassical poetry or romantic poetry and modern poetry is totally different from all these because of the new rhythms, new dictions that they have brought in. We should remember that rhythm operates at many levels through meter. What are those levels? Phonology, sound, syntax, grammatical construction, semantics, meaning and pragmatics the kind of effects the poem may have on readers. Let us examine meter now. According to T. S. Eliot, poetry begins with a savage beating of the drum in a jungle. So, poetry started with the people in the jungle, savages, when they started beating the drums. Even now, when we listen to some musical band, we hear the beat and we start aligning ourselves with the beat. A Shakespearean director has said 
that meter is a real key to understanding Shakespeare. Now you can see how important is meter in reading and understanding poetry. Then what is meter? Meter is a measure of emphasis in a poetic line. In English, metrical units are based on stresses and syllables. To understand meter, we have to understand stress and syllable. We will examine them gradually. Sounds in poetry are similar to speech sounds. Poets when they write poems establish a pattern and then break that pattern for variety in their sound patterns. It is believed that every poem has a particular sound pattern that we have to identify as readers of poetry. Basically, there are four kinds of meter in many languages of the world. Quantitative meter is found in Greek and Latin languages. This meter is measured in terms of relative duration of the utterance of a syllable and how it is found recurrently in long and short walls. The second meter is syllabic meter which is found in French and Romance languages. The number of syllables within a line of verse irrespective of the place of stresses indicates that it is syllabic meter. The third meter that we see is accentual meter. This is found in Old English Germanic languages. The number of stressed syllables within a line irrespective of the intervening unstressed syllables shows the accentual meter. We find accentual syllabic meter in modern English. It is seen through the recurrent pattern and number of stresses and syllables in poetry. We will deal with English meter in the next few minutes. How do we analyze meter? We have to remember that meter differentiates poetry from prose. Poetry, when we say words, it is a metrical composition. There is an individual poetic line with a sequence of words as a separate entity on a page. There is a pattern of strong and weak stresses. Stressed syllables make strong stresses unstressed syllables make weak stresses. We have this example from Wordsworth's Tintin Abbey. We have shown this stress through underlining of individual words. For I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but to be hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating though of ample power to chasten and subdue. For I have learned to look on nature not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes a still sad music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating though of ample power to chasten and subdue. There are many factors in stress that we have to understand. One is word stress, another is slavic stress, one more is metrical stress and the last point we have to remember is structure words do not generally contribu contribute to stress. In word stress, words of more than one syllable generally receive stress on the first syllable. In syllabic stress, monosyllabic content words receive stress. For example, nouns, verbs, adjectives, Noun is a monosyllabic word, for example. Metrical stress is based on previous metrical composition, how the po whole poem is composed. There will be a pattern of strong and weak stresses which we have to understand. To understand stress and meter, we use this term a foot or feet. A foot is a combination of strong and weak stresses. As we said earlier, structure words do not generally receive stress. What are these structure words? 
conjunctions, prepositions, pronouns and things like that. In English, we have different kinds of meters based on the number of syllables, disyllabic that is two syllables together or trisyllabic, three syllables together. Disyllabic meters are known as I am, trochi, spondy, peric. We will see them slowly. Trisyllabic meters are anapest, dactyl, amphibrach. What is this iambic and trochic? An am has one unstressed syllable and another stressed syllable. Trochic has a reversal of this iambic that is it begins with a stressed syllable and ends with an unstressed syllable. We have a good example from Shelley's Adonis. I have highlighted iambic through red color and trochic through blue color. I weep for Adonis, he is dead. I weep, he is dead. Oh, weep for Adonis, though our tears thaw not the frost which binds so dear a head. And thou, sad hours, selected from all ears to mourn our loss, rose thy obscure compeers and teach them thine own sorrows. Say, with me died Adonis till the future dares forget the past his fate and fame shall be an echo and a light unto eternity an echo that is i am eternity within the same word we have trochic and iambic four syllables are there within this one word eternity let's see spondic and peric meter spondic means having two stressed syllables in your word and prick means having two unstressed syllables in your word or in your foot. Andrew Marvel's poem The Garden is a good example. Meanwhile, the mind from plea sureless withdraws into the its happiness the mind that ocean where each kind does straight its own resemblance fine, yet it creates transcending these for other worlds and other seas, annihilating all that is made to a green thought in a green shade. We have highlighted this spondic and peric meter in the last line to year, both words are not stressed that is peric, green thought both words are stressed that is it uh, spondic. Similarly, in here is peric and green shade two words with equal stress they are part of this spondic meter. Within the same line we have both spondic and peric that is how poets create patterns or varying patterns in their poems. Anapestic and dactylic come under this trisyllabic meter. Anapestic has two unstressed syllables and one stressed syllable. Most often quoted example is Byron's The Destruction of Sennacherib. The Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple gold. Dactylic means one stressed syllable and two unstressed syllables. Tennyson's poem, The Charge of the Light Brigade has this beautiful lines. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death rode the 600. Now, we move on to this metrical line. Depending on the number of meters that we have, number of uh, foot that we have in a line, we call it uh, monometer or diameter or other names. So, the number of feet in a line decides a meter. If you have one foot, it is monometer. If you have two feet, then diameter. If you have three feet, trimeter. Four feet, tetrameter. Five feet, pentameter. This is a normal meter that we have in many English poems. If you have six feet, that is called hexameter. In iambic measure or iambic meter, it is called Alexander. It has a different name. If you have 7 feet that is called a heptameter, if you have 8 feet that is called octameter. As we said, 
iambic pentameter is a common measure in English poetry. If this is the verse rhythm that is often used in English poetry. In this meter, we have 5 feet and 10 syllables in a line. I am means, let us remember unstressed syllable and stressed syllables. We indicate this unstressed stressed through this notation da dum da dum da dum da dum. Poets play around this structure to create different effects by changing the stress pattern and adding syllables to create variations and emphasis. When we do not rhyme that is when we have an unrhymed iambic pentameter it is called blank verse. This is a distinction that uh, students of poetry have to remember. Rhymed iambic pentameter is called heroic couplet. When there is no rhyme, when there is no meter it is called free verse. So, remember blank verse is unrhymed iambic pentameter, heroic couplet is rhymed iambic pentameter and free verse is unrhymed and non-metrical. Remember free verse has rhythm, it has its own rhythm not in a conventional format. Here we have an example for the different combination of feet within the same poem. The number of feet is indicated along with the lines on the slide. Now let us read the poem An Ode to Ben Jonson by Robert Herrick. Ah oh Ben, say how or when shall we thy guests meet at those lyric feasts, made at the sun, the dog, the triple ton, where we such clusters had as made us nobly wild, not mad, and yet each verse of thine, how did the meat, how did the frolic wine? As you can see, the number of foot varies from 1 to 5 in this poem. One of the important exercises that we do when we read poetry is scanning. Scanning helps in identifying the meter of a poem. What do we do when we scan a poem? Read a poem line by line, analyze the component feet, find the major pause in the line and establish the dominant meter and feet. John Keats poem Endymion gives us a good example. A thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases, it will never pass into nothingness, but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. You can see the lines indicate the metrical units and the two lines slanting lines indicate the pause that we have within the line in the middle of the line. We also have what is known as sprung rhythm, it is specifically associated with one poet Gerald Manley Hopkins. What he attempted was to return to the alliterative old English verse. He used strong stresses and alternating patterns plus he used rhymes as well. He counted the rhythm by stresses rather than by syllables and meter. The example that we have is the manuscript of the Windover, how he wrote this poem with sprung rhythm. We have rhythm in free verse as well. Let us recall verse means metrical composition, free verse is free of verse that is metrical composition and yet it is poetry. It is an open form called V libre in French. It may be arranged in irregular line lengths. The actual base model is from the King James Bible in English, which was published in 1611. Poets like Blake and Arnold use this free verse in their poems. Walt Whitman, the American poet, experimented with this free verse extensively in Leaves of Grass. Here we have this example from one of his poems, Oneself I Sing. Oneself I Sing, a simple separate person, yet utter the word democratic, the word en masse, of physiology from top to toe I sing. In this presentation, we have looked at the relationship between poetry and music, poetry and rhythm and we have shown how the music or rhythm is the heart of poetry. Musical quality of poetry is achieved through 
repetitions, use of rhymes and rhythm is achieved through meter. We also noticed that rhymes, repetitions, alliterations and assonances contribute to achieving rhythmic qualities, musical qualities in poetry. The picture we have here is the modified uh, version of British lyre. The first picture we saw in this presentation is a Greek lyre. Now, the picture that we see is a British lyre. We have some references, please do look into them.